to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy. Taurine is what a lot of people claim is the supplement industry's best kept secret. So much so that it's no longer a secret and we've got a lot of publicly available information on the topic. And I'm here to synthesize it for you to tell you what has merit and what doesn't. So it's an ingredient in a lot of popular energy drinks, most notably Red Bull, and inspired its name derived from Taurus, as it was initially isolated from the bile of the ox. But don't worry, Red Bull and other products use synthetic taurine rather than taking it from the bull's GI tract or testicles as some even believe. And as taurine is naturally occurring amino acid, there's quite a bountiful amount of research on it if you search through peer-reviewed databases, more so than most if not all of the peptides we've discussed. And as you'll see, the research really is all over the place. And instead of doing what we have to do with peptides and look at every single individual source of preclinical and clinical data, given the huge barriers in research, we can actually go through literature reviews together and determine what facets of taurine use has been proven to be based on legitimacy versus what needs further investigation. And finally, what, if anything, is bunk? Okay, so let's get started. Taurine, or 2-aminoethanosulfonic acid, is technically a non-essential amino acid, meaning that we can synthesize it ourselves. Though it's often referred to, and as you'll see in literature, it's referred to as conditionally essential. Due to limited synthesis under certain conditions or when the body's under stressors, like illness for instance, when we're talking about its synthesis, it primarily takes place in the liver via a series of reactions that require two other amino acids, methionine and cysteine. And in other mammals like cats, it's interestingly an essential amino acid, as in it's needed from their diet. And it's utilized for bile acid production, digestion, heart health, vision. And when we're talking about species, species that need to get it from their diet rather than when we're referencing it as conditionally essential. It comes down to an ability enzymatically to produce taurine via endogenous processes versus an inability to do so, which requires getting it from other sources. However, in humans, despite the recent interest and research, we can't say we know a particularly ton about its interaction within our body, given the complexities of biochemistry and physiology, and up until until recently, there wasn't any perceived utility of using taurine as a biomarker, and efforts to now are limited by reliable laboratory tools available at that. Now, although taurine was initially isolated from ox bile in 1827, it was found to be quite diverse. And interestingly, it resembles gamma aminobutyric acid, or GABA, the inhibitory neurotransmitter notorious for the effects of alcohol and benzodiazepine medications. And on top of that, taurine is thought to be an agonist of GABA-A receptors which means there may be some sort of role in nervous system depression. In other words, through this interaction, binding GABA-A receptors may contribute to potential neuroinhibitory effects, though its role is clearly not as potent or similar to that of alcohol or benzos. Regardless, from a research standpoint, some of the possible roles that have gained taurine the most clinical interest include vision and retinal health, other nervous system roles, and cardiovascular function. And at this point, there are no clinical recommendations for taurine management, if you will, i.e. there are no national recommendations for intake or mainstream laboratory testing protocols to analyze deficiencies and consequences of such in a normal human population. However, that hasn't stopped companies from developing and selling it en masse since the early 1990s. And does that mean that it's not worth looking into? Of course not. And if you're still watching and want to hear more of this type of content that is mostly peptide-derived, obviously not entirely, please give us a like and subscribe. It goes a long way, or don't. Either way, I'll keep making these videos, but who doesn't like a good stroke of the ego here and there? Regardless, some foods high in taurine include different types of seafood, like scallops, tuna, tilapia, octopus, as well as turkey, and chicken, seaweed, and beef. Now, interestingly, newborns have limited ability to synthesize taurine, despite the fact that it's present in breast milk. And although the benefit of adding it to formulas isn't entirely clear, 
it's considered that newborn deficiencies in taurine can predispose to impairment in lipid absorption and retinal issues. So in reference to what we were discussing earlier in the video when it comes to newborns and infants, taurine is considered more essential than it is considered conditionally essential. Or due to limitations and enzymatic processes, babies are more prone to deficiencies in taurine. Now, taurine does appear to be pretty ubiquitously expressed in the brain, heart, muscles, and retina. So when the synthetic amino acid is supplemented, its levels seem to peak in about 90 to 120 minutes of consumption, and if not transported to tissues in need, it's excreted in a urine. And interestingly, in mice, lacking the transporter that brings brings taurine into tissues, rendering a lot of its use ineffective, they developed retinal degeneration, liver disease, muscular atrophy, decreased exercise capacity, cardiomyopathy, and other heart-related insults. And they're even more prone to neuropathy and diabetic mouse models. This same research exhibited that with impairment in taurine use comes mitochondrial damage, thus highlighting the possible role of taurine as an antioxidant and other research has shown that taurine is likely in a way intertwined with maintenance of mitochondrial health. But as always, with rodent models, we have to ask ourselves, is this translational to humans? And in this case, is this specific transporter deficiency model akin to a human with a taurine deficiency, which is likely a distinct process but may have overlapping roles? From a neurodevelopmental standpoint, it does appear that taurine plays a role in retinal development and health, and thus, some feel it may be a candidate for management of ocular diseases. And not only is taurine's concentration in the retina notably high, but in animal models, its deficiency has shown visual impairment, retinal oxidative stress, and degeneration of other components crucial for vision. And as we said earlier, it's pretty popularly believed, although controversial in a way, that supplementing taurine in newborns is very important for development of appropriate retinal health. Now, as far as an intro goes, I think this is a solid starting point. So now we're going to segue into the research that I imagine most are interested in because the compound's being investigated in so many different contexts and this video could be days long. So if there's something about taurine that isn't in this video, something you want to hear more about, let me know in the comments and I'll either make another video, we can start a discussion in the comments, whatever's simplest, I suppose. Now, with regards to cardiovascular health, Taurine supplementation has been thought to be impactful for some time, with a good amount of data coming out of Japan, who found it to be quote-unquote clinically effective in management of heart failure in addition to conventional therapies. And there's good literature review analyzing the studies that have evaluated use of the supplement within this role. And some show benefit with regards to certain parameters, and others are less clear, confounded by the different types of heart failure and the fact that a larger study in ischemic heart failure patients who received cardiac rehab showed pretty insignificant findings. There's a component of research that looked at quality of life and that did interestingly appear to be greater in the taurine group than in the placebo. And in one study that analyzed taurine use over a long period of time, there were subjective improvements seen in reported symptoms like breathlessness, leg swelling, and in just how these people felt. But a limitation in understanding the research on this topic in particular is the presence of lower quality studies. While there are promising small studies, it's a popular idea that larger clinical trials are needed to confirm taurine's efficacy with regards to heart failure and its utilization alongside common practice. Also, interestingly, some research has shown Shown that with taurine supplementation comes beneficial attenuation of blood pressure in some patient populations. How? Researchers are unsure. But a leading theory, as you'll see as a pattern, involves regulation of mitochondrial metabolism. Likewise to those evaluating cardiac health, research that evaluated taurine in diabetic populations has been in a way unclear as well. While some data exhibits unchanged glucose metabolism, others have shown improvement in diabetic complications like nephropathy, retinopathy, and neuropathy, as well as positive changes in metabolic parameters and limited populations. Once again, some of this benefit is thought to entail mitochondrial health, as inflammation can be modulated through the supplements acting as an antioxidant, and diabetes, like a myriad of other chronic conditions and illnesses, are significant for inflammation at the core of which lies mitochondrial damage. Now, of note, when we're talking about taurine's proposed antioxidant effects, its antioxidant effects are interestingly more indirect. Rather than directly scavenging free radicals, taurine stabilizes cellular environments and modulates oxidative stress 
through osmoregulation and cell membrane protection. In other words, taurine's antioxidant role may involve modulation of inflammation and reduction of oxidative stress due to improved mitochondrial stabilization. Now let's get to talking about exercise as taurine is in some spaces considered part of a well-rounded pre-workout. Taurine's of interest because it's present in muscle tissue and exercise has been shown to upregulate the transporters that move taurine into muscle cells. So like some of the other factors we've analyzed thus far, when it comes to exercise, the results are quite mixed and limited. For instance, one study showed improvements in oxygen intake, while another, where taurine was used alongside caffeine, showed no significance across multiple parameters. This dichotomy reflects the broader body of research, where consistent findings are notably absent, especially when it comes to exercise capacity and strength. The most relevant finding per what I read is that it does appear most consistently to influence DOMS or delayed onset muscle soreness, though researchers describe it as less clear too. However, if you had to make an assumption based off the body of literature at this point, it would be that the greatest benefit would be served with aerobic oxygen requiring performance like running than it would be for more anaerobic outcomes like lifting picking things up and putting them down. And now when it comes to mood, this is another area of interest to taurine. Remember, it's expressed in the brain, retina, heart, and muscles. And as such, there's one thing we haven't addressed yet, and this is mood. We kind of addressed part of the brain when we're talking about retinal health and neurologic conditions, and this is mood. And if you go online and look at people's experiences, a popular anecdote in some way or another revolves around effects on mood, whether changes in depression and different types of anxiety, even rebound anxiety from stopping taurine after use. Some of the preclinical data at this point has shown decreases in anxiety response behaviors as incited by certain toxins like ethanol and lead in zebrafish. There were also preclinical and in vivo models that hint that taurine may affect survival, differentiation, and proliferation of neural stem cells. For instance, by activating expression of BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which could exhibit an implication in depression and we've actually talked about this neurotrophic factor previously in videos about Simax and Solank, amongst others. And BDNF is being more and more investigated with regards to not only its role in neuroplasticity, but also in mood and disorders of mental health. One of the trials that took a look at these factors in rodents described a model of chronic, unpredictable, mild stress, which I wish the authors didn't abbreviate. Taurine's an interesting one. We've only just touched the surface, and I'm aware this is one of my longer videos. And I'm sure in the near and distant future we'll have more on this. It appears generally safe. Maybe one can experience some gastrointestinal side effects. And as it's considered to possibly have some antihypertensive properties, I would be worried in people who with lower blood pressures or those who perhaps take medications to lower their blood pressure. Taurine may also inhibit an enzyme called CYP450 that's involved in metabolism of many drugs, which if so, could lead to potential interactions with multiple commonly prescribed medications, which is something else to keep in mind. However, the extent and significance of these interactions are still under investigation, like with pretty much everything else. And it puts me in a funny place, because taurine is one of those things that appears to be significantly well-researched, and trust me, especially when compared with so many of the compounds we've talked about, it is, but in spite of all that, the varied results all point to the need for larger clinical trials. It's a popular opinion within this scientific community. Heart failure, mixed results. Aerobic activity, mixed results. Hypertension, maybe? That's not to say you won't see preclinical evaluations touted as life and health span enhancers in certain rodent and insect models, but these also highlight in their discussions need for further research, and a decent amount of the data that you'll see is likely more confident or generalizing than would typically be acceptable, but that's more of a personal opinion. One thing that seems to be evident, though, is that in some way or another, taurine likely intertwines with mitochondrial health, thereby supporting its role as an antioxidant. And since mitochondrial damage is pretty ubiquitous when it comes to chronic illnesses, it's not unlikely that at some point larger trials will assess the utility of taking taurine for a population of people that can certainly benefit from anti-inflammatory effects 
physics at a biochemical level. But at this point, research is more suggestive rather than conclusive. And that may be controversial in some spaces, but within the scientific community, as we stated, it's clearly popular opinion. And if you read through these literature reviews, you'll see why. But for now, that's all I got. As always, thank you for your time and thanks for watching. If you're looking for a further way to support the channel, the link to the Patreon will be in the description below. But most importantly, I appreciate it. Have a great day. Take care. Cut to the chase, evidence based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.